together with government and the private sector would constitute an essential pillar for a functioning state. So the idea is that if you look at our state, right, there are three major players. The government, the private sector, and what we call the third sector, which is civil society. And what we are looking for is our, for our government to be accountable and responsive, right, and represent our interests, right. We are also looking for the private sector to be job creating, right, to be dynamic, and to some extent also be civic cautious, to be cautious about their civic responsibility. And then we want a civil society that is robust, that is sustainable, that is influential, that can be seen as a strategic partner. Right? That a sector that should be taken seriously in terms of our development process. So in Ghana, civil society has emerged as a key stakeholder. So we know that civil society is now recognized as a strategic partner. We participate in public policy processes. We are known to be filling in the gap when government cannot deliver in terms of service delivery. We engage with, on several issues. And we have a lot of civil society organizations that engage with different issues and are invited by government and not only the national government in Accra, but also local government to participate in decision making in communities. But civil society is what? It's growing and evolving. Civil society in Ghana 20 years ago is different from civil society now. So we have very diverse organizations. Back in the day, it was dominated by the typical traditional NGOs. Right now, we have community-based organizations. We have paid based organizations, we have women's groups, we have diverse actors, and even we have social movements, right? Farmer-based organizations, and then and social enterprises, all sorts of different types of things, right? So, <clears throat> but nonetheless, even though we are growing and we are evolving and we are more dynamic, we are generally what? Fragile, right? And what has happened is that we are excessively dependent on external, uh, external donor funding. Right. So if you look at the funding profiles of many of our civil society organizations and you look where is the money coming from or the resources coming from, you'll notice that almost up to 90-95% of our money is from external donors. Right? And that is, makes us excessively dependent. Right? So we are under immense pressure to operate and survive right? because what is happening is that this funding pool is dwindling. Donors are shifting their priorities. Right, donors are responding to issues in their homes, in their countries. They have serious issues with immigration, crime, other issues that affect their youth. And the citizens in those specific countries that give us money are asking questions on why they are sending huge amounts of money to African countries like Ghana. Right? And, then, and so many of them are shifting their priorities and they have different strategic priorities. So you will notice that advocacy issues, maybe on women's issues, the funding is it's, it's dropping. HIV, the funding is dropping. And specific issues that may not be their strategic priority. So it's putting pressure on us in an increasingly competitive sector so that the pool of funding that we have is in one place, is with these donors, and we are all rushing for it. So it makes it extremely competitive. And in the midst of all that, we are trying to maintain our independence and our influence. So we are we are balancing the donor interest with the interest of what? Our own communities. And sometimes that balancing act is quite difficult because, of course, we all have different interests. But because we need those resources, it makes it difficult for us as civil society. So overall, the picture of sustainability, especially funding viability, which we've talked about, appears to be very challenging. And so we need to respond uh, to that. So what is Star Ghana and Waxi doing? So what we did was in 2014, getting to 2015, we launched a research because what we didn't want to do was to sit in our offices and based on our experience, say that this is the problem. So we launched a research on the state of civil society sustainability in Ghana to get a clear picture of what that state was and what the issues were and the proposed responses to that issue. So we started to get the evidence because we, did, we believe that it is based on that evidence that we could develop a program that can respond to the challenges that we saw. So after we got that evidence, we thought, okay, this is the research, but we need to go through some sort of validation and some sort of reinforcement to verify 
that what we got in the research is what is really happening. So we said that, look, let's organize some convenings. But let's go around the country. Because this country goes beyond Accra. Right? People have different contexts in which they operate. We need to hear from the people on the ground themselves on what they think the sustainability issues were. And so almost all of you were part of that process as we went around the country. So we had four convenings and we got feedback and, and perspectives from all of you and also feedback about the research and those convenings. And so when we got that feedback, that enabled us to develop a national civil society strategy. Now, if you look at the national civil society strategy now, it's a very interesting strategy because it's not a typical strategy. It has ideas, it has strategy, it has examples that any of us can apply to our own situation. We are currently trying to look at that strategy and design it in a more user-friendly way. So we are working on that now to make it look more user-friendly, bring certain things, highlight on certain things, so that you can easily use it on, for your day-to-day -day as a reference reference guide. So as we developed that strategy, we felt that it was important now to start moving or moving forward the sustainability discussion, having workshops with selected organizations who have shown interest in responding to this sustainability issue. So there are many organizations that start Ghana out work and there are many organizations in Ghana, right? But we decided that it's not necessarily about the numbers, but it's about strategic organizations that have shown interest. So we decided that, look, let's look at 60 organizations. Let's start to work with 60 organizations. And that is why we sent that questionnaire or that call. We sent it out because we wanted to see those who were really interested. Because this process is not really the traditional process of, oh, the donors have come, and we are doing this because of the donors. We are not doing this because of the donors at all. We are doing this because we want to sustain our organization so that we can make an impact in the community. It's about us, right? And so we wanted to see the mindset of organization because this whole discussion is about a mindset shift. You have to be ready in your mind as an organization to shift in a certain direction for you to see the results. And so we selected organizations for the Northern Belt, the Middle Belt, and the Southern Belt, like Jim uh, referenced, that we are going through these workshops. But the most important things about these workshops is that we want to see organizations applying themselves and developing these strategies and, and, and actually making things happen. And we're trying to give the best support that we can to all these 60. And like Jim said, out of the 60, 20 will be chosen to give uh, further support to. Then we have a, a program we have with Change the Game, as wax because we have a sustainability program. One of the areas that Change the Game responds to is alternative funding, which is domestic resource mobilization which we've been talking about in Ghana too, right? So we have a training program on Change the Game Academy. I believe the Catholic Action for Street, yes, Children Project was part of Change the Game Academy program, where we focus on building capacity for domestic resource mobilization. So looking within Ghana, what are the possible places where we can get funding for our programs? From the private sector, right? From <clears throat> local government, or even from the diaspora, or from individuals. So we're trying to change the mindset that when you say donor, you don't think the person from US, Denmark, um, Holland, etc. But you also think that you are a donor, and I am a donor, that we are all donors, right? And that we give in Ghana. If you go to church, we give. I've been at church where we mobilize in a day almost 20,000, 30,000 cities. So it's not like we don't give. I've seen people giving for people to build houses for them for school fees, for our brothers and sisters upkeep. But the issue is that how do we get Ghanaians to give for social justice issues? And the only way you can get Ghanaians to give for social justice issues is if our organizations are connected to them and they see our organizations as part of them. So they will give to support those organizations. And also if they are accountable and transparent. If Haruna wants me to give to them, the first question I want to know from Haruna is what are you going to do with my money? And how are you going to prove to me that money will not go into Haruna's pocket or Haruna's wife's pocket? Are you understanding me? That is Ghanaian's basic problem. When I talk to my wife, who is a business person, eh, she, it took her four years to understand what I do. He said, you people are too abstract. You are all over the place. Right? So we have married you for four years. Now that I get it, my goodness, your messaging, 
What is wrong with you guys? You're doing so much good work, but nobody knows about it. You don't connect with us because you spend your time investing all that relationship building with who? The donors, right? But not with us, who you claim you are representing. But maybe if you spend time, the same amount of time with us, we may, some of us will decide to go into our pockets because we believe in what you're doing and give money, some of our salaries. You don't know, you'll be surprised every month into the work that you're doing. But of course, if I'm giving money to you, you have to show me where that money is going and the impact it's making. So these are some of the discussions that we'll be having. So, so far, what have we done? And I've talked about the research and what the research came up with. So the research said that if we feel that the state of civil society sustainability in Ghana remains challenging, and that the sustainability of civil society is quite, is quite far from satisfactory, right? That means we are not even in a satisfactory position together. We have a serious problem. We are living from hand to mouth. You understand? Some of us, if the projects are not there, the organization will not survive beyond three months. Some of us live annually. It's a very dangerous thing to do. So we've been so concerned about our survival, which is fine because many of us, it's our livelihood. We get our livelihood from the organization. But the question you have to ask yourself is, you have some, the organization is surviving to do what? And I think the concern now we should have is building organizations that survive, but go beyond survival, that thrive to make that impact so that the community is invested, so that you don't worry so much about your survival, right? So the study also gives an indication that several civil society organizations are currently just surviving and struggling to thrive. And then the study also produced something which I thought was a real breakthrough and a justification for this whole process. It said that there are four dimensions of sustainability. For me, it was very revealing. It said that there's operations, there's identity, there's prog programmatic impact, and there's financial. That is, it went further to say something which is even more break for me, a, a breakthrough. It said, seek ye first. That's what it said, though. Seek ye first operation, identity, and impact. And the financial sustainability shall be added unto you, if you are borrowing from the Bible palace. Right? Aha. Uh -huh. It didn't say, seek ye first the financial. Law. It's saying that look at your operations. That means your system and your structures, your leadership and your governance. Look at your identity, your relevance, and your legitimacy, your so-called connection to the constituents. Are you accountable and transparent to them? Are you accountable and transparent to your peers? Or you are focused heavily on accountability to donors? So somebody said we are good at accountability, not accountability. Because we, are, we spend our time on donor reporting. Do you understand? So what are you looking at? Programmatic impact. How are your programs designed? Do your programs have ownership, or you're one of those organizations that do projects, that the funding finishes, and then the project stops. And then when you go and ask the community, they say, oh, this angel, they moved on. Uh, so why are you guys not sustaining it? Ah, it was their project. And there's a lot of projects like across Ghana. They are projects. The, the community is there in the community, but the community doesn't see it as part of them. So how are we designing our project? So it's saying that, what the research is saying is that if we focus on building operations, Strengthening our identity, our visibility, our engagement, etc., our relevance. If we work on how we do design our programs, how we collaborate to do things, the financial sustainability will necessarily be an outcome. Because you see, you have to understand, a lot of partners of ours are looking for credible people to work with, including the so-called donors, even the private sector now. When I talk to private sector organizations, they say, you guys are not organized. You see, when they say that, it's beyond mobilization. They are talking about our systems and structures. He said, if you are organized, we will find you and we will support. You understand? So this is what our discussion is going to be about. How do we strengthen all these areas? A lot of emphasis on the first three. And then, of course, financial is also important. Right? So we've been through, this is a summary of what I've said. We've been through the national convening. We've developed a strategy. Now we are trying to build regional champions like you guys. So you guys are the champions. So when you say you are the champions, there's a lot of pressure on you. I don't miss my words. So pressure, serious pressure, that you guys are the best example from the regions. 
right? So wherever we go, we make noise like this. So if they live in Ghana, we go to Nigeria, start mentioning ugly death, blessed. So if they come for working visits, they have to feel that, no, Charles, you, you are right, though, these people are really champions. Is that we need to have an enabling legal governance and institutional framework for civil society to be right? Enabling environment, that means we need to look at regulation. That came out strongly. A law that regulates civil society, but a law that enables us to grow. A law that does not make us difficult for us to thrive, right? A law that usually should have come out of self-regulation, right? And many of you thought about the fact that we need an umbrella body. So the experiment with that body looks like it may have some, it has had some serious challenges. And even some experiments with regional NGO blocks are still a challenge. I think there used to be an Ashanti one. There was Morengo, there was more than, some of them are not working well. So how do we make those things work well? Those things, the donors will not help us all. I think I have to be blunt here, the donors are not interested in the sustainability directly of our organization. Let me put it that way, maybe indirectly. But they are more interested in the sustainability of what? Their project. Too. I don't know if I'm speaking to people here. Yes. We are speaking amongst ourselves so we can be free. Uh -huh. That's why I said directly. I'm not saying indirectly, they are not. Sometimes they're indirectly because they're doing good work. They will try to help you sustain. But it ultimately, their whole idea is to sustain what? The project. So the sustainability of our organization is our ultimate responsibility. And these are things we need to be clear about. And then promote networking. So a lot of us have been complaining that we don't network, we don't share information, and we don't collaborate. We've been complaining for 20 years. Some of us have been here for like Mr. Rockatete, Mr. Wilson. This thing has come up, I think, in almost every meeting, and it's still coming up. So the question is, why? Why? What is the problem? Selfishness. <laughs> what is going on? You know, so we need to change I mean, our attitude. Somebody talked about competitive advantage versus collaborative advantage. And somebody also talked about, hey, these consortiums, these big organizations in Accra, they don't give us fair partnership. They bring us on board, and then they seem to be taking all the resources. So there's a certain way we are dealing with each other that needs to change or collaborate with each other. Hiding information is not a popular thing to do these days. It's archaic <laughs> and boring. <laughs> it doesn't even help you. You understand? Collaborating is the thing to do now because you specialize in something, then you go to somebody else who specializes in something, and you bring your efforts together. We need to get out of this selfish stuff. And that one, no donor can help us, right? And then how do we reorient our staff and board members' mindsets? Especially staff, skills, right? And ability to maintain staff, which is another big problem in our organization. Because many of us, we hop around very, very, very fast. Right? And sometimes we are pushed by INGOs. No, that's, isn't that so? <laughs> so? So some of you are EGs, they are frustrated. You build their capacity, they go for maxi training, and all of a sudden, two weeks later, they tell you they are leaving for Oxfam. Right? But they, <laughs> this is an example, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so the question is how, <laughs> how do we then sustain, uh, or what you call? Our staff, how do we motivate our staff? Is it always about money or is it about the leadership staff? What are the other extrinsic or even intrinsic benefits? How do we make sure that our staff are happy, they are working, they, and that, that we are building succession within our organization? You know, the whole issue of succession planning, usually when we talk about it, people are going for the heads of executive directors like Oraka Tete and Arthur. This guy can be there for too long. You know, there are people cry, where will you go and let the young people come? But the succession planning conversation is not only about executive directors. It's actually a bottom-up approach. So at every level of the organization, how are you grooming people to take over in case people leave? So the so focus should not be on the top. Do you understand? But at every level, it's a plan that you're doing. Right. So set up robust, agile, internal accountability. So we brought this another thing. For those of us who have been working, some of our seniors here, this accountability and transparency issue has been coming up all the time. And it doesn't seem to be going away. Our ability to account for the money or funds that we receive. I've had so many interesting stories that you can actually produce films with when it comes to this thing. Wonderful stories of what people have used money for, including marriage, buying cars, disappearing, 
you know, and the donors are so frustrated. And that's why they keep on strengthening their reporting templates. And the sad part is that these reporting templates keep us occupied yes. on reporting so much that we even forget about our core jobs. Yes. And it's not their fault, because they are also need to report annually. And they need to uh, make sure there's value for money. So based on your integrity and transparency, it also aligns with the kind of reporting template they share with you. It's simple. Okay, so we need to work on those issues. And then develop, we've talked about staff capacity, cultivate a culture of innovation and adaptation and experimentation. How innovative are we? Are we still doing things the same way? Do we welcome new ways of doing things? Are we willing to experiment and adapt to changes? Are we learning from each other? That's a very big question. And then the issue of specialization, sorry, that came up. That there are some NGOs that are like jack of all trades. They work in four or five thematics. So you're wondering, which one are they specialists in? So are we specializing in the things that we are doing and ensuring that we are well known for those things? Or we're trying to spread ourselves chasing the resources. When you hear there's funding here uh, in youth, even though you've never worked with youth, you stretch your work on, uh, what you call it, maybe uh, trade. Stretch it in a way that will touch the youth. And sometimes when you read these proposals, you get a headache. You're trying to see, but this guy is trying, but Charlie, the link is not there. <laughs> it's not linking. It's not linking. It's not linking. Yeah, it's HIV. You are doing uh, something on governance elections. The guy is stretching elections and the nexus with HIV. I'm like, which nexus? And you know, these donors, they laugh. When they see these things, they're like, but this guy is not serious. And they start to blacklist. How do we keep to our mandate, eh, but keep on making it relevant? Right? Those are the things we should look at. And then develop alternative funding streams. Now, we don't have a choice. Though. And this is the reality. The reality now is that we need to look at different ways of getting funding. One of the ways we need to do is to look within, look at our diaspora. Those who say Ghanaians don't give, it's a lie. Ghanaians give. I've been on a plane. The people gave to comic relief from UK to, uh, to Accra here, London to Accra. I saw Ghanaians taking out pounds after they watched the comic relief advert. And I said to myself, wow. So Ghanaians can give like this. Because they, that advert is one minute, some 15 to 20 seconds. But it's very touching. And, the, and you could see many of the people who are there were not absolutely fantastically educated Ghanaians. Very average, who have stayed in the UK for a long time. But I asked somebody, why did you give? He said, oh, Charlie, this, they are helping our people in the north. And I know them. And I went to the Charities Commission website. And I saw that all, they are in good standing. All the money they receive is there. All what they are doing with it is there. The project in the world is there. And I saw the project in Ghana. And I said, okay, then they'll use it for the right thing. So Ghanaians can give, but we need to create a philanthropic culture that goes beyond giving for mobile phones. And, and the usual, <laughs> yeah, we need to create a philanthropic culture that is more community-led and community-centered. And we feel that, look, the government cannot do everything for us, which is truth. Those of us who think that the government can solve our problems, we are lying to ourselves. That the communities themselves to come together and try to solve their problems, and it gives you leverage over this government. When you do that, when you tell the government to jump, they will jump. You say hi, they will jump hi. They are scared. Fools. Yeah, you don't play. You know, this company, they don't play games. Yeah, they do their thing. So if you tell them what you want, so you're not serious with them. But if it's too dependent on government actors, then they start to feel that they are the ones who have all the power. Right? So we need to look at these things. Then understand the diversity and scale, and I talked about private and domestic philanthropy. How, how can we mobilize money from the multinationals, from our own indigenous businesses, Tobinkos, there are many of our own businessmen who are doing things. And usually our people, we like to invest in our hometowns. It's a way, it's our thing to show that, yeah, we are giving back to our hometown. Now if you are working in somebody's hometown who is a big man, do you have any relationship with them? Do you know what they are interested in? Can you get them to invest? And it's, it's, it's not always about finance, also non-financial contribution to them. And then we need, we need to plan for sustainability 
as a core strategic objective. And I think this is why we're going through this process. So that as part of our strategic planning, one of the elements of our strategic plan is a what? Sustainability plan from the word go. Do you understand? So that we think it's not that we wait and still having a problem, then we start to think, oh my God, sustainability. We need to correct those things and have a sustainability plan that works for our organization and actually move along with it. So I would like to just conclude so that something that we reflect as we're going through this process, two things, that we need to rethink our operating models, the way we operate, let's rethink it. We need to think strategically. One of my colleagues said that you can have a strategic plan. It doesn't mean you think strategically. Do you understand? So we are wonderful with our strategic plan, but are we thinking strategically yeah. about our financial models and adopt strategies that will help us maintain our independence or security and still be sustainable? And I think the most important point is that our pursuits for sustainability should not be driven solely by our need to survive, but rather by the causes we pursue for the benefit of our communities. So yes, we want our organizations to survive, but to make an impact. So your drive for the sustainability of your organization, you should be looking at the community, what you can do with the community to advance that community. When you look that far, that community then will invest in what you're doing. So the question I always ask organizations, if the government decides to behave like some governments, they decide that we are tired of the noise, Network for Health Relief Foundation, Street Children Project, Women's Integrated Development is doing. So we are coming to shut you down, right? We are coming to make sure you don't operate again. They enter into your place like they went after the radio stations, right? <laughs> right? How many of the people that you work with, or your partners, will stand up and rise up for you? Will they fight for you? If they don't fight for you, then you know you have a problem. That means you are not connected to those you, are, you say you are representing. And if you are not connected, those are the most important constituencies. So we need to turn our mindset upside down. From this donor, donor, donor thing, to our hour, am I connected to my constituency? The people that say I pledge Ghana claim they represent, are they, do they know I'm representing them? Do they want to invest in pledge Ghana? The people that arbiters say they represent. And this is what the conversation is going to be for the next three days. So thank you very much.